Morning. Can you hear me? I think you're mute. Are you mute, muted? <laughs> no. <clears throat> if you've got a keyboard, I'm, I'm looking at my keyboard and it's in the upper top, sort of to the right. There's a little picture of a speaker, no? If you want to call Ellen, she'll, if you want to call Ellen on your cell phone, she'll help you at the church. You there now? I'm in. Oh, good. Good, good, good morning. Good. Hello, Ginger. Hello, Eleanor. Good morning. Good morning. You all doing well? Hello, yeah. Doug. Yes. Good. 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 Yeah, it's a good day. The sun is shining. <laughs> My deck is wet. It must have rained during the night, but it's beautiful right now. Well, good. That's good. What chapter are we on? Well, you know, we're sort of lumbering along here. We'll, we'll get into two, two and three and four. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you should be able to hear me now. Yes, we can. Did she fix you up? She must have, because it wasn't anything I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. good, good, good. Yeah, sometimes the uh, sound is harder. Um, I, believe it or not, I'm the host. Normally, Ellen is the host or Rob, um, and they and and when they are the host, they they mute you, all of you at once. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. So if you want to jump in, or we have a a barking dog, or whatever happens, it's okay. And, uh, we can be we can be uh, very relaxed. Um, I, will, I will tell you, Doug, that it really helps the speaker if we are muted. Okay. Because the um, it, it, if we're all taking all the energy 
then you don't get as much as you need. So that's why they mute us. And it's easy to unmute and say something, but okay. well, I'm well, gonna- if, if you know how to do it, go ahead and mute yourself. And then if you wanna say something, just unmute yourself. Oh, gotcha, we'll do that. Okay. All right, let's start off in prayer with our friend Walter Brueggemann from down the road from some of you all. <clears throat> um, our old, probably the best known and most prestigious Old Testament Hebrew scripture scholar of recent days. So let's pray. The, uh, he titles this prayer, We Are Second and You Are First. So let's pray together. Before our well-being, there was your graciousness. Before our delight, there was your generosity. Before our joy, there was your goodwill. We are second and you are first. You are there initially with your graciousness, your generosity, your goodwill. And we receive from your inscrutable goodness, grace upon grace, gift upon gift, life upon life. Because you are there at the beginning, at all of our beginnings. We pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. So, there we go. Um, I'm going to do a brief recap and mention some of the things that we talked about last week and the week before. Our, um, <clears throat> our friend John Calvin said about Paul's letters to the letter to the Romans, if we have gained a true understanding of this epistle, this letter to the Romans, Calvin says, we have an open door to all of the most profound treasures of scripture. So um, we have lots of prestigious people who are, who are uh, spent their whole lives uh, ministering to others and studying, saying that this letter, it may be one of the most important books of the New Testament. Let me remind you that Paul spent about 10 years, probably from 47 to 57, <clears throat> uh, energizing, uh, evangelizing with energy the territories east and west of the Aegean Sea, the area we now call Turkey and Greece and Macedonia, um, and uh, probably dictated this letter to his secretary, Tertius, probably in the year 57. We're not positive, but we think that's right. And this book has been described as a full statement of the gospel of Jesus Christ as Paul understood and proclaimed it. So this is, uh, this is uh, Paul's gospel, clearly, uh, written to the church in Rome. It was, so, um, it was so impressive, even early on, I told you that Clement, who was the foreign secretary of the Roman church in, in AD 96, so we're still in the first century uh, in Rome, he was the foreign secretary of the Roman church, uh, knew Paul's letter to the Romans, the entirety of it by heart, which is really saying something. <clears throat> um, so we talked about some of Paul's concepts, flesh, bodily flesh, or ungenerated flesh. He uses the word flesh a lot in his letter, uh, and it's prior to receiving the grace of God. And then, he uses the word spirit, and spirit is set against flesh as a concept, and it's the God conscious element in human beings. Um, it, it, in the spirit, he refers to in the spirit as ourselves after we're regenerated, after we've been um, received the grace of God. Uh, he also uses the word law at least 70 times in this, in this letter. And law, of course, to a Jew is the Pentateuch, the Torah, or maybe all of the Old Testament, including the prophets and so forth, wisdom, the law of Moses. But he's, he's very concerned because the Jews, as you know, relied on the law as a path to salvation. And he says that that's not right. You can't do that. Um, another author that I read said <clears throat> that Paul's letter to the Romans is a message which reveals God's way of putting men and women right with God's self by the exercise of faith. Putting, putting men and women right with God by our exercise of faith. So we, we receive 
in the first instance, God is first, we are second, as our prayer reminded us. Um, God puts in us the power to believe what Jesus said about God. That when, when Paul uses the word faith, he, what he means is that believing Jesus when Jesus talks about God. In our reading today, we'll see that what made Abraham a, son, a child of God. Abraham, you know, Abraham had, had all kinds of good characteristics and maybe some bad ones, we don't know. Um, he certainly lived a long and interesting life. But what separates Abraham from all other people, maybe, of his time was he trusted God. Now here he is in his 90s, uh, and, and God says, pick up your family, your wife, your sheep, your wealth, all your followers, and I'm going to take you on a trip, which might be the equivalent of one of us leaving cashiers and heading for Oklahoma. I mean, on foot. And, and Abraham says, okay, God, I trust you. That's good. I'll do that. <clears throat> Pretty amazing. So God um, believed and trusted God. Um, now I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, I told you, I think last week, see where I am here. Last week I said, God bestows on humans a righteousness, not, which is not our own, but God's. The righteousness of God is justification of the unjust. It's God's way of pronouncing the unrighteous to be righteous. So what just, and this is justification. Uh, I told you last week, it's like Harry Potter's cloak of invisibility. Harry Potter is not invisible, even though he's under this cloak, but he appears to be invisible because of the cloak. We are not truly righteous. Uh, we're just under a cloak, and the clo cloak is, is God's cloak of righteousness that he puts over us, and God sees us as being righteous, even though we're still sinners. And that, and that change in our status a change in how we are reckoned by God, how we are seen by God, is referred to by Paul in this letter as justification. And then Paul goes on to say, now that you're justified through faith, you need to live a good life. You need to be on the path. You need to be facing the right direction on the road. And you need to be crawling or walking or walking, speed walking or running or sprinting uh, towards what I would have you be, which is a glorification uh, at our death, of becoming one with Jesus and God. So justification happens in an instant, where our status is changed in an instant. Uh, sanctification is a lifelong process of doing good works. If you ever read James, that's really what James is talking about. It's fine to do good works, but we need to do good works in the name of Jesus, and we need to take uh, the energy of the Holy Spirit uh, to do our good works. Sometimes we're, we feel weak or we feel lazy or we feel distracted. And the Holy Spirit is the power in us to do the good works to reflect the love of Jesus Christ in our lives. So we're transformed over our life by this sanctification process. And in the process, we become new people we become new people. Some people say born again. We become new people um, in the same way that people were adopted back in first century Palestine, which I talked to you about last week. And one of the things I told you last week is that when you're adopted, your old life is erased, it's wiped away, uh, and your new life is as the newly adopted son of some other person into a different family. So you have uh, a change a complete change from one life to the other. And that's what the process of sanctification is. You change from uh, your old self to a new self uh, into the glory of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> um, so let me now resume. Uh, and so I read you last week, I think I read you last week, I get my classes confused. It's not that I do 75 classes, I only do two. You wouldn't think I'd be confused. But. Sometimes I am. I read you about the Duke of Windsor, right? <clears throat> the Duke of Windsor, whose name, I know you know his name. Um, he, 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 uh, he died in May 28th, 1972. 
His name was Edward Albert Christian George Andrew Patrick David. That was his name, the Duke of Windsor. He was the uncrowned uh, King Edward VIII. He died in Paris. And when his life was being recounted, they played back some TV footage where he said years before, my father, who you may remember was King George V, my father was a strict disciplinarian. Sometimes when I'd done something wrong, he, George V, the king, would say, would admonish him, uh, the young boy and say, my dear boy, you must always remember who you are. And so we are reminded every single day that we are children of God, that we have been justified, and that we need to get on with our good works, even if we're tired or lazy or distracted. We still need to, because that is how we show the power of Jesus Christ in our lives and we take our strength from the Holy Spirit. So we're now kind of going to chapter three. <clears throat> um, and so um, Paul uh, uses this literary, I, I told you a little bit about it last week. It's called the diatribe. Um, and so he has a conversation with a fictional person. So he asks the fictional person a question and then the fictional person answers the question. So he's having a, a dialogue with somebody who's not there. Uh, the, the person he's having a dialogue with is, is Paul the Pharisee before he met Jesus on the road. So it's kind of like he's having a conversation with his old self before he met and, and committed to being a follower of Jesus and his new self after he met Jesus and uh, was given his life's work. So from chapter three, then what advantage has the Jew or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. For in the first place, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Will their faithfulness nullify the faithful of God? By no means. When he says by no means, you see where he says that in four? What he's really saying is hell no. He's really saying, he's really exclaiming. He, he might be, you know, he's walking up and down dictating this and he might have his fist and pump his fist and say, by no means, but what he really means, if you want a better translation is, hell no, that doesn't work. Although everyone is a liar, let God be proved true as it is written so that you may be justified in your words and prevail in your judging. So here's this justified again. But in our unjust, but, but if our unjust justice serves to confirm the justice of God, what should we say? You know, he's talking to himself. He's asking questions to himself and then answering that God is unjust to inflict wrath on us. I speak in a human way. By no means. Again, he's saying, hell no, that's wrong. For then, how would God judge the world? But if through my falsehood, God's truthfulness abounds in his, to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not say, as some people slander us by saying that we say, let us do evil so that good may come. Their condemnation is deserved. So what he's saying is you can't sin more because God uh, has justified us. And, and the more you sin, the more God forgives you or God regards you differently than as a sinner. There was a guy <clears throat> who was a priest in Russia um, back in the uh, 19th century named Rasputin. You may have heard of Rasputin. He was, he was an Eastern Orthodox Christian monk. And he was adopted, kind of uh, brought into the court of the last czar of Russia in the latter part of the 18th century, early part of the 19th century. And the reason was is because the czar and the czarina's child was a hemophiliac. And Rasputin sort of had some sense of how to protect this child from bleeding to death. Uh, hemophiliacs, if you bump them or hit them, they can direct, uh, have a bruise and actually bleed and die. And I think Rasputin had some sense of how that disease worked and how to protect that child. So the czar and the czarina liked him, but his theory was the more you sin, the more God forgives and that's good because God's forgiveness is good and therefore sin a lot and get forgiven a lot and, you know, he. he and, and, and what, and he, but he didn't read this third chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. Because Paul's letter says, 
let us do evil so that good may come. And then he says, hell no, that's completely wrong. So if Rasputin had read that, he wouldn't have had that view, but that was a view he had in any case. So here we have Paul talking to himself uh, and answering his own questions. Um, and he does say, in this chapter, and it's and it's also said in Psalm 147 and Deuteronomy 4, that the Jews were God's special people. They were the sole, the Jews in the Hebrew scripture of the Old Testament, were the sole custodian of what we call special revelation. Uh, there's two kinds of revelation. There's two ways we know God. One is in nature. So if you get up early one morning and go for a walk in beautiful cashiers and the sky is blue and the birds are singing and the sun is out and, and you see, you know, God's creation and God's creatures. Uh, that is uh, natural revelation. Everyone can see that and everyone knows that that's God's work. <clears throat> so you don't have to be a follower of Jesus Christ to see that. Everyone can see God's revelation, but there's a different kind of revelation uh, by which we know God. So we know God by taking a walk in the morning and, and, and seeing the beautiful skies and the beautiful, and the beautiful, uh, creatures of God, which reminds me of a joke, which I'm very bad at telling, but Rob's not here, so I'll tell it on him. It's not on him. It's just about priests. So he may not, he might not, if he were here, he may not laugh, but you might. So this couple wakes up very early on Sunday morning and they're in bed and it's Sunday morning. And he's saying, you know, we go to church every single Sunday and I'm kind of feeling lazy and maybe we should just stay in bed and, you know, have some coffee and read the newspaper. Maybe I'll go for a walk in the morning or play a little golf and let's just skip church today. And his wife says, no, 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 we can't skip church. We go to church every Sunday. And he says, no, I think I'm going to just lay in bed for a little while longer instead of getting up and have a little coffee leisurely and maybe go for lunch. She says, no, no, you can't do that. You can't do that. And he says, well, maybe I, she says, no, 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 you can't. And he says, all right, give me one good reason why I can't do that. And the wife says, because you're the priest. You have to go to church. <laughs> anyway, Rob's not here, so we can tell that joke. I think that's funny. <laughs> and I'm a terrible joke teller, so forgive I, me. I thought it was funny, too. <laughs> we can sneak behind Rob's back and, and tell that joke. So the Jews in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scripture, the proper name for the uh, Hebrew, uh, Old Testament is the Hebrew Scripture. The Jews were the sole custodian of special revelation. That's not general revelation. General revelation is going out in the world and seeing God's beauty and creation. Special revelation is God's inspired word through the prophets, through the Psalms, through the Torah. It's, 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 it's holy scripture. Now we have the New Testament as well. But the Jews, Paul says in chapter 3, they were the sole uh, custodians of special revelation. Then he goes on. And he says, there's no one who is righteous, not even one. We said we're all sinners, and that's, a, that's why we have justification. It's a good thing we do. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. And then he goes on, in, uh, in through starting in 10 and all the way through to 18, and he does seven quotations from the Old Testament. I'll read them to you. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. There was no one who shows kindness, not even one. Their throats are opened graves. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their paths. And the way of peace they know not. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Those are seven quotations. One's from Ecclesiastes, five are from Psalms, and one is from Isaiah. And he's, what he's saying is that the ungodliness of sin, the pervasiveness of sin, and the universality of sin. It's all very strong language. Uh, he goes on, 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it, speak to those, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. He's saying the law, that's the, the uh, commandments or the Torah, the, the Testament, the Old Testament, given to the Jews. Tell, now we know what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to murder. We're supposed to honor our mother and father. You know, we're supposed to do what the, the law says. 
And, and so we, we are now held accountable for that. And then he goes on in 20 and he says, for no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes knowledge of sin. So the law tells us it's, it's a sin to murder. The law tells us that. But no one can be saved by following the law because we're all imperfect. And that's what the Jews thought. Up until Jesus, the Jews said, if we follow the law, we'll be saved. We'll have salvation. Jesus said, no, you won't. No, you won't. You can only have salvation as a gift from God because you're justified. And that's what Paul is saying here. No human being will be justified, will, be, will have their status changed and before God, will receive God's righteousness through faith. You can't do it through any act, including the acts of following the law. The only way you can do it is, is well, I'll go on. In 21, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. What is faith in Jesus Christ? Faith is believing what Jesus tells us about God. That's what faith is. For there is no distinction since all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified. We talk about it. They are now justified by God's grace as a gift of God's grace through the redemption that is Jesus Christ whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this. God did this. God put Jesus forward to die to show God's righteousness because of God's divine forbearance. He had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that God himself is righteous and that he, God justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. 21 to 26 Chapter 3, 21 to 26, some academics say, and I'll quote, is possibly the most important single paragraph ever written. Possibly the most important single paragraph ever written. Chapter 3, 21 to 26. So the righteousness of God is covers us like uh, a, a tarp of, in, of invisibility. And, God, and, and we are declared righteous. We're not righteous, but God declares us righteous because of his grace. And, you know, people have struggled with this over the years. People have been reading Paul's letter for thousands of years. And so we have the Council of Trent, which was a big deal in 1545. And the Council of Trent, which is all the bishops, came together and they declared that justification took place at baptism person was cleansed and infused with God's righteousness. I don't know whether that's right or whether that's wrong. I don't know whether the Council of Trent was right or the Council of Trent was wrong. But I know that through faith, it says in Paul's letter, which is a gift from God, our faith is a gift from God, God's grace. We believe because of God's grace, not because we're such great people, uh, that we are justified before God. So I've been talking a lot. Anyone got anything to say? <clears throat> I do, uh, Doug. I, one of my, I have an NIV translation of my Bible. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. Right. And, uh, and it has a little bit different um, in verse 22, which okay. makes a big difference. It says, this righteousness is given through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to all who believe. Yeah, so that's, a di that's different, isn't it? It's really different. Yeah. It, and it kind of makes sense to me because sometimes, I mean, we are told um, the gift is, the gift of salvation is through faith. Righteousness yeah. is through faith. And, but sometimes, you know, we feel like we don't have faith enough. Um, for many things, and it, it is just almost reassuring that what, the faith we have to depend upon is Jesus's faith, not ours. I you mean, know, my note says, my, let me listen to my note, you'll laugh. My note says, the alternative translation in note A is the faith of Jesus Christ, just as you said. And yeah. that says, 
that translation is becoming increasingly preferred. Yeah. It yeah. says it, it conforms this phrase to identical structured phrases in 3.3 and 4.12 and 16, the faith of Abraham, and reflects the importance for Paul of Jesus's faithful obedience. So I like it either way. Yeah. I like it either way. I don't, I'm not going to... I'm not going to pound the table and tell you one's right and one's wrong. I like both. Yeah. So we, we are, are saved by the grace of God that we have faith in Jesus Christ. And we're certainly faith saved by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, goes, Paul goes on in four and, and says, what then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? In quotes, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him, who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. So also David speaks of the blessedness of those to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose inequities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one against whom the Lord will not reckon sin. So, you know, we, we have to trust God. We have to do good works. If you want to bone up on good works and see what the Bible says about good works, read James, the book of James, probably written by James, the brother of Jesus. We don't know for sure, but likely, at least certainly possible. Um, but um, here we got Paul who's dictating and, and you know, Paul was a very well-educated guy. Uh, he studied under the most famous, well-regarded teachers of his, of the entire time. I mean, he was studying under whoever was the <clears throat> number one professor of the time. So he's a very smart, thoughtful guy. And he writes in this, <coughs> excuse me, or he dictates, he doesn't write, he dictates in this kind of language that can really make us toil and sweat. <clears throat> it's not easy to read. And then in 4.5, he says, but to one who without works trusts him, who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteous. What he's saying is that God justifies the wicked. God justifies the wicked. God justifies everybody. So God you know, if you're a universalist, this is, uh, this is when you'll, your ears will prick up. Um, God justifies everybody. God changes the status of everybody. Now we need to live out a, a life of righteousness to, to, as our debt for our, for our forgiveness from God, our justification from God. But what he's saying here, and he says it in other places, uh, in 5, 6, he says, um, even more startlingly, uh, for a while we are still weak, at the right time God died for the ungodly. God, Jesus, uh, uh, Christ died, sorry, Christ died for the ungodly. So he's saying Jesus Christ died for the wicked. That's in five, chapter five, verse six. This is revolutionary stuff. This is the stuff that makes the Pharisees go crazy. When they hear this, they, they can't believe Jesus says this. And the, re the reason is, is because there's references in the Hebrew scripture to say, whoever forgives or justifies the wicked is doing an abomination. And so Jesus is saying just the opposite. And Jesus is saying that, that God justifies the wicked. And Paul's saying it, and, and the rabbis are just, I mean, they can't believe this. this I can't even give you a, I can't even give you a, I mean, it's like, think of the worst person in the world and, and that person says, I'm the re, uh, reincarnation of Jesus Christ, the savior of the world. I mean, you just go, that's, 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 so, that's a horrible thing to say. I can't even believe you said that. That's the way the, the, the Pharisees regarded this sort of understated statement of Paul's. Uh, we skip by it and, and don't, even, don't even stop maybe sometimes, but to say that God justifies the wicked or Christ died for the wicked, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a terrible, terrible thing to say uh, if you're a Pharisee, to hear if you're a Pharisee, but uh, Paul said it and said it again and again and again.
So um, Jesus Christ died. He's saying to remove our sinfulness, our defilement. Um, um, and when he died, Jesus bore our sin and, and his death took away what would be our death. I will, we'll read a little later that the Jews believe that the result of sin is death. So we are sinners, therefore we will die and not have any resurrection. We'll have no afterlife. Jesus died and took our death away from us. So we don't have to die so that we could be, have an afterlife and be resurrected and have eternal life in God. And that's what Jesus did for us. A very big deal, I might say. <clears throat> Um, so G, uh, Paul says the means of justification is faith, faith in Jesus. He says that in verse 22, in chapter 3, verse 25, and verse 26 um, um, of, of uh, chapter 3. Um, he says it a bunch of times. Um, he says uh, in 26, it was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, God himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. That's 26, he says it in 25 and 22. Uh, our friend Martin Luther, who was a, one of the reformers in the 16th century, added the word alone. And, and it was to emphasize that good deeds could not save us. Um, sometimes when you want to change human beings, you got to say, very extreme things. If you want to change people from way over on this side to get over into the middle, or just to get to the middle, you got to say something that's way out on this side. That's the way human nature is. So Martin Luther said extreme things. And he said, Paul says, justification by faith in Jesus Christ. Martin Luther said, justification by faith alone. He added that word. The word alone is not in Paul's letter. Uh, to emphasize the importance of faith, because people were drifting back to what the Jews believed was you could have salvation by deeds, by good deeds, by good works. So my friend Barclay, who is one of the many people I read, uh, says, justification by faith in Jesus means we have a right relationship with God because we believe what Jesus told us about God we are no longer terrified strangers from an angry, angry God, but children of a loving God. Jesus won forgiveness for our sins. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jesus redeemed us from the power of sin. The way of obedience to the law is concerned with what a person can do for him or herself. The way of grace is concerned with what God can do and has done for him or her. Paul is insisting that nothing we can ever do can win for us the forgiveness of God. Only what God has done for us can win us God's forgiveness. Therefore, the way to a right relationship with God lies not in a frenzied, desperate, doomed attempt to win acquittal by our performance. It lies in the humble, penitent acceptance of the love and the grace which God offers in Jesus Christ. I wrote all that down because I loved it so much. And um, going back to 327, <clears throat> um, Paul, again, I'm just telling you this for form, starts his conversation with his alter ego. He goes back to the diatribe. He starts talking to himself. He asks himself questions, and then he answers his own questions. Then what becomes a boasting? And then he says, it is excluded. And then he says, by what law? By that of works? And then he answers, no, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. So here's Paul the Pharisee asking questions and Paul the Christian follower of Jesus Christ answering his own questions as he paces up and down and poor Tertius is trying to write it down. It's, it's kind of a funny scene. Um, so I, I, I talked to you about uh, James, the book of James, and James says most notably, the uh, and, and people say that James conflicts with Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, Martin Luther wanted to throw James, the book of James, out of the Bible. He didn't like it. 
uh, he, called, he called it bad names, the gospel of straw. Uh, and the reason is because he thought that James was saying you could be saved by works. I don't think James was saying that. And people that are a lot smarter than I am agree with me, <laughs> or I agree with them, as the case may be. James said in 2.18, the authenticity of justifying faith is seen in the good works to which it gives rise. I will show you my faith by my works. What James is saying is you can have faith, but if you don't, if your faith doesn't inspire good works, it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. You can go around saying, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And if you don't do anything about it, it doesn't mean anything. You've got to show your faith by what you do, like Abraham. You know, Abraham trusted God. When we act and do good works, we uh, are trusting God, and, we, and we're using the period of the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so in 417, he, uh, moving along here a little bit, I can find it. He says, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, uh, Abraham, in the presence of, God, of the God to whom he believed, who, and this is talking about God, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. God gives life to the dead. And as that famous American philosopher Woody Allen once said, he said, it's not that I'm afraid to die. He just, he went on to say, I just don't happen to want to be there when it happens. So we need to mix a little likeness into Paul because if we don't, we'll go crazy. <clears throat> uh, in in uh, 23, he says, this is chapter four again. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, Jesus, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. Jesus Christ died and was, was raised from the dead to, so that we might be justified, so that our status before God might be changed, that we may be deemed to be righteous even though we're not. Um, and then he goes on and says, therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're up to chapter five. Any comments, questions? You, you know, it's always interesting to me. Um, of course, Abraham was called by God when he was 75 years old. He was an old guy, wasn't he? He no. was an old guy. And then, so he didn't get the promise, I mean, he, the promise was not fulfilled of his being a, the father of many nations until he was a hundred right. and he wasn't circumcised until he was 99. So right. it just is amazing to me, the long periods of time um, that he had to wait for any um, confirmation of the, or any, any sign of the promise. And it's a really, I mean, if you think about that scene, so God's having a conversation with Abraham, uh, Abram at the time, and yeah. his wife Sarai is listening at the door. <laughs> she's she's, 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 she's uh, snooping. <laughs> this conversation between Abraham and God, and, and God tells Abraham that you're going to be the father of many nations and you're going to have uh, a child. And she, and she knows how old Abram is because she's, the same age or close to the same age and when she hears that she laughs can you imagine laughing at god so she <laughs>, laughs she laughs when she, when she hears this old coot who's her husband who you know is incapable and she's incapable she's just as incapable as he is they're both incapable and she hears god say you're going to have a son and she laughs and i would too <laughs> You'd be afraid to, I think, but I, you might. I don't know. It's so funny. I yeah. would laugh. <laughs> yeah, you would laugh. And so, um, and do you know anybody named Isaac? Abraham Isaac? Isaac was the son. Do you know anybody named Isaac? 
You know what Isaac means in Hebrew? He laughed or she laughed. That's what, I, that's what Isaac means. So they, they named their child, she laughed. That's so, funny. Uh, I think God would laugh with them. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? So um, I think next week uh, we're going to start. Uh, next week, uh, I'm going to kind of, uh, I forgot to tell the men this, but next week I may cancel class because our little sweet Lulu dog is being operated on next uh, Wednesday. Um, and so I may cancel class on Thursday, uh, depending on how it goes. But she's Ooh. having a, a mass taken off of her liver, which is a major, major. Operation. She's that's big. She's not that old. She's only seven, almost eight, but uh, it's a big deal, and we have to do it, or it's not going to work out well. So we have to take a chance. So it's uh, we hope it goes well. It may not, but um, so just kind of be be relaxed about class next week. If we miss, we'll catch up and um, say a prayer for Lulu on uh, Wednesday morning. All right. It's Lulu. Yeah. Lulu. She's our little miniature schnauzer. She's sitting next to me listening to the lesson in her bed. <laughs> <laughs> we will pray for Lulu. Pray for Lulu. She's a sweet, she's a sweet little baby. She's a miniature schnauzer. Okay, so uh, let's pray and uh, hopefully we'll see you, see you all next week. Let's pray. Dear God, we, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your holy scripture and we thank you for your assistance in giving us insight into this difficult letter that Paul wrote so many years ago to the church in Rome. We pray that you would let us take a lot from it, that it, we would think about it, and that we would act upon it to become your servants, your children in the world. We pray for those who need your company and your strength, for those that are sick and need help and need food and need other necessities of life. Let us do our part and be your hands in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you all. You, Thank you, Doug. Have a great Thank week. You, Doug. We will see you next week, hopefully, uh, if not soon thereafter. Okay. Bye-bye. Blessings. Bye, -bye. Bye Lulu. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.